Welcome everyone to the continuation of our lecture series on the latest advancements in cross-coupling reactions. In the previous sessions, we delved into the fundamentals of cross-coupling reactions and explored key ligands pivotal for generating highly active catalytic systems. In this lecture, we will delve into a crucial aspect of this field, focusing on the most significant preformed catalysts and their representative applications. The efficiency with which the catalytically active, monoligated palladium zero complex is formed before entry into the catalytic cycle is a key factor. In the selection of reaction conditions for palladium catalyzed cross coupling reactions, if a palladium 2 salt, such as palladium acetate, is used, reduction of palladium 2 to palladium zero must occur before the cross coupling reaction can take place. This reduction can be achieved by the amine component in an amination reaction especially if the amine possesses hydrogen atoms alpha to the nitrogen atom, enabling the palladium 2 amine complex to undergo beta hydride elimination. Alcohols can similarly reduce palladium 2 to palladium 0. Phenylboronic acid or other organometallics are also capable of reducing palladium 2 precatalysts. In this case, a transmetallation to palladium 2 is followed by reductive elimination of phenyl acetate, generating a palladium 0 active precatalyst. If primary amines alcohols, or boronic acids are not present in your reaction mixture as substrates, you can still consider adding them in catalytic quantities for the activation of palladium-2 precatalysts. The phosphine ligand may also influence the reduction of palladium-2 through reductive elimination of phosphonium salts, such as phosphonium acetate, generated in the case of palladium acetate. However, this process is likely slow with bulky, electron-rich phosphines. Traces of water can be beneficial for the reduction of palladium-2 species mediated by a phosphine, as water can hydrolyze phosphonium acetate to phosphine oxide, making the process irreversible. Therefore, it is recommended to use a slight excess of a phosphine over the palladium-2 source, as part of the used ligand can be consumed for the reduction of the precatalyst. Until the early 2000s, the most frequently applied catalytic systems used to be generated in situ by mixing a palladium precursor with a ligand. The most common palladium sources were palladium acetate and palladium dibenzilidine acetone complexes. However, this strategy for catalyst generation has several notable drawbacks. First, it was noted that the DBA ligand can have a poisoning effect on the catalyst. Although palladium acetate and palladium dibenzilidine acetone complexes are readily available palladium precursors, their purities vary significantly, depending on their preparation and supplier. In addition, many of the highly active electron-rich phosphine and NHC ligands are air-sensitive and can be deactivated by oxidation before the in-situ generation of the active catalyst, which can become a serious complication during the scale-up of a cross-coupling reaction. Very often, for the in-situ generation of an active palladium catalyst, the ligand must be applied in excess which is not optimal considering the fact that the most active phosphines and NHC ligands are normally more expensive than the palladium source. These problems were not anticipated in the beginning of the cross-coupling era but were identified and highlighted only in the last two decades. The solutions did not take long to emerge, and nowadays we have access to a number of structurally different pre-catalysts demonstrating exceptional activity in cross-couplings. The earliest examples of cross-coupling reactions involving organic chlorides employed bulky and electron-rich triacylphosphine ligands, such as triterpbutylphosphine or tricyclohexylphosphine, followed by, to some extent, Buckwald's first phosphines and NHC ligands. These ligands were also the first to be incorporated into the first-generation preformed palladium catalysts. In 1995, Beller and Herman reported the synthesis of the first preformed thermally robust paladacical dimer catalyst based on triorthotolophosphine and demonstrated its improved activity in coupling reactions involving chlorine substrates. Five years later, in 2000, Beller demonstrated the preparation and isolation of the first palladium zero monophosphine complexes. These complexes were then tested for their performance in the Suzuki coupling of aryl chlorides. These precatalysts contained electron rich, air sensitive phosphine ligands and were more stable than the parent ligands. Notably, it was observed that the use of the well defined pre formed catalyst 4 resulted in superior results compared to the use of in situ formed catalysts. Herman reported the first synthesis of a pre formed palladium zero dicarbene complex 3. It was not a particularly good catalyst, nevertheless, it formed the basis for the development of the highly active palladium Pepsi complexes. 
The modern preformed catalysts containing tertiary phosphine ligands can be categorized into three groups, depending on the nature of the generation of catalytically active monologated palladium zero species. The first group consists of palladium zero catalysts with two bulky ligands. The monologated palladium zero species are generated by the dissociation of one of the bulky phosphines upon heating. Some representatives of preformed palladium zero catalysts with two bulky ligands are presented here. These are coordinatively unsaturated, although they cannot adopt more bulky ligands due to steric hindrance. However, they are far more stable than corresponding free phosphines, which are normally pyrophoric. This tritert butyl phosphine palladium zero complex is commercially available and is among the most frequently used catalysts from the list of analogous precatalysts. Numerous reports demonstrate the superiority of this precatalyst over in situ generated catalytic systems. An example supporting this was presented by Hartwig in a study on the palladium catalyzed amination of 4 chlorotoluene. The second group of modern precatalysts is based on palladium 2 complexes possessing two bulky ligands. In this case, the active monologated palladium 0 species are generated in two steps. First, dissociation of one of the bulky phosphines leads to a T-shaped palladium-2 intermediate, which is further reduced to the corresponding monologated palladium-0 species. The sequence of these two steps can be switched. Some commercially available palladium-2 complexes possessing two bulky ligands are presented here. This group of preformed catalysts is far more stable in the presence of air compared to the previous group based on palladium-0. The bulky phosphines connected to palladium-2 can be monodentate or can be linked into a bidentate ligand, as seen in pre-catalysts 14 and 15. There are many interesting transformations enabled by these catalysts. For instance, pre-catalyst 13 can be a superior catalyst for Nagishi-type couplings performed in micelles formed in water. As starting materials, researchers have used aryl bromides and alkyl halides. Organizing reagents were formed from the reaction of alkyl halides in the metallic zinc in the micelles. The typical catalyst loading for the reaction was 2 mole percent, but in some instances, it could be reduced further. The third group of pre-catalysts was developed in the group of Buckwald and is based on palladium-2 paladasticals possessing a bulky phosphine. In the presence of a base, these paladasticals undergo a reductive elimination, generating corresponding monologated palladium-0 species and an indole derivative. They have developed several generations of precatalysts. The major difference between these paladasticals is that they proceed with reductive elimination at different temperatures, thus demonstrating distinct stability. While first generation Buckwald paladasticals exhibit a wide range of reactivity in an impressive array of cross coupling reactions, they require more forcing conditions for activation, possess a short lifetime in solution, and require a multi step synthesis involving unstable organometallic intermediates. The second generation paladasticals possess a more acidic aromatic amine and can be activated using a weak base at room temperature. However, larger ligands such as Brettfos and tert-butyl exfos cannot be incorporated. The third generation of paladasticals replaces the chloride in the first and second generation paladasticals with a less coordinating and more electron withdrawing mesylate counteranion, allowing for the incorporation of larger ligands. Here are presented three examples. The second generation pre catalyst bearing Beller's phosphine and third generation pre catalyst with S phos and A phos, respectively. Many more pre catalysts are available through common chemical suppliers. Here is another good example of how advantageous pre catalysts can be over the in situ generated catalysts. The conversion of 4 chloroanisole in the Buckwald Hartwig amination initiated by the catalyst generated from the mixture of palladium dibenzilidine acetone complex and X phos was just 25%. Meanwhile, for the same reaction performed with the X-Phos Palladium G1 precatalyst, the conversion of the limiting reagent was complete. One of the most recently introduced precatalysts is the Palladium 2 allyl complex bearing a suitable bulky ligand. These precatalysts were predominantly developed in the group of Colicot. These systems share some similarities with Buckwald's precatalysts in terms of generating catalytically active Palladium 0 species. It is believed that upon heating, these systems release corresponding monologated palladium-0 pre-catalysts through the reductive elimination of an allyl chloride or other related products. In heterocyclic carbene ligands constitute the second major group of prominent ligands and are frequently used in the form of palladium pre-catalysts, capable of generating monologated NHC palladium-0 species. 
Palladium Pepsi complexes were introduced by the group of Oregon and are highly effective catalysts for cross couplings involving difficult substrates. Successive generations of these versatile pre catalysts have focused on increasing steric bulk at the ortho positions of the in aryl group of the NHC ligand, which has been linked to improved catalyst performance. Palladium Pepsi complexes have some similarities with Palladium II complexes possessing two bulky phosphines. In the case of Palladium Pepsi complexes, the second L-type ligand is 3-chloropyridine that can dissociate easily, generating T-shaped NHC palladium 2 species, which can be reduced to corresponding NHC palladium 0 active pre-catalysts. Palladium 2 paladacicals possessing an NHC ligand are the second major group of pre-catalysts and were introduced by the group of Nolan. These systems have many similarities with Buckwald's pre-catalysts possessing phosphines and are commercially available. In this case, the NHC palladium-0 active precatalysts are generated from reductive elimination of a carbazole derivative upon heating. Systems based on nickel are the last group of preformed catalysts worth mentioning, as they demonstrate very unique activities. Nickel-based complexes are normally very reactive and are more efficient than palladium systems for certain cross-coupling reactions. The enhanced activity of nickel complexes can be used to enable cross-couplings involving very unreactive substrates such as aryl carbamates and carbonates. On the other hand, increased reactivity of nickel precatalysts makes them less stable, thus hampering their preparation, handling, and storage. Precatalysts based on nickel-2, nickel-1, and nickel-0 have all been used in successful cross-coupling reactions. Accordingly, the mechanisms of nickel-catalyzed cross-couplings can be quite different from those observed in palladium-catalyzed reactions, and among other possibilities, they can include radical intermediates. As we learned in the previous lecture, NHC ligands bind particularly well to late transition metals, which in turn leads to the formation of stable complexes. This is why most of the known stable nickel-based precatalysts are based on NHC ligands. Alternatively, enhanced stability can be achieved with chelating ligands. This is why the most successful phosphines used for the production of nickel precatalysts are bidentate phosphines. Here, in the top line, selected precatalysts based on nickel 2 are presented. The precatalysts in the middle are based on nickel 1. The catalysts on the bottom are based on nickel 0. Unfortunately, there are only a few commercially available nickel precatalysts. In summary, a similar relationship exists between the rapid development and innovation of cross coupling and the evolution of mobile phone technology over the last two decades. One can imagine a parallel between the high value features of state of the art catalysts and the advanced features of modern mobile phones. Yet, Advanced features of modern catalytic systems are not essential for less challenging cross-couplings, and less advanced but cheap catalysts still can serve a purpose. It should be noted that the holy grail in cross-coupling methodology is the development of a universal catalyst that can achieve equally high conversions, regardless of the nature of coupling partners. This still remains unachievable, despite the incremental steps taken to develop more robust and reproducible catalytic systems for specific reactions. However, by applying logic, experience, and intuition, today we are closer to predicting a few catalysts for many cross-coupling transformations. This and some other related topics will be described in the coming lectures where the main focus will be put on the selection of appropriate catalytic systems for very unreactive substrates. Thank you for your attention.